were off the coast of northern Vancouver Island on the fishing vessel Nordic Queen with Captain and Chief Harold Seaweed and his sons, as well as Dallas Smith, president of the Nauencolis Council. They're on a food fishing trip getting halibut and prawns for their community. We'll be talking with them about their vision for their territories and how the North Vancouver Island Marine Plan can help make their vision a reality. My name is Mom Q All Seaweedy. That's my, uh, my chief name and potluck's name. My Christian name is Harold James Seawood. I am a hereditary clan chief from the Weomuscom clan of the Quixotinook people and from Guilford Island. When I told my grandfather my choice was to be a commercial fisherman, he said, you could be a brain surgeon or you could be a ditch digger. But as long as you love what you do and you do well at it, you will have a great life. So I've fished all of my life and it's been a good life. And it's treated me well. My crew consists of two of my sons and one of my son-in-laws. And then uh, Tony, he's a very close uh, friend and so we consider him a part of our family. This is a uh, food fishing, food food fishing for our band members, and uh, they're trying to stop us from using so many traps, using less traps. But it doesn't make sense to me because there's so many band members and not enough prawns going to one trap to feed a whole band. We're a coalition of First Nations who are working together through land and marine use plans to build a self-governance model that will evolve over time to help our nations regain control over their traditional territories. We started together with terrestrial planning in the late 90s and understood that for the plans to be complete there had to be the marine component and so over the last half dozen years we've been working diligently with local government marine stakeholders to develop the northern Vancouver Island marine plan and that's going to be integral for us going forward when it comes to economic development protection um, food social ceremonial um, fish issues allocation issues this plan is really going to be the foundation for us going forward with with our governance aspirations you know colonization had brought our people out of our territories but they're still chiefs and leaders who still live in their traditional territories and didn't care what government said. They said, you know, we'll repatriate our lands ourselves and we'll rebuild our communities that you forced us out of. And so it's a tremendous story to see these communities reestablish themselves in a place where someone told them they couldn't live anymore. So these people had these homelands that sustained them for thousands of years. It's like the walkway that goes into the big house. This is my grandfather's house from years and years and years ago. He grew up here when he was like little, little, young. And then in the late 60s and early 70s, the government figured it was too hard to control us out in these territories, so they colonized us and moved us into reserves and amalgamated our communities. And over the last 20 years, we've seen a lot of our leadership say, you know what, that's not acceptable to me anymore. I'm going to find a way to rebuild my community. And they've really been integral parts of our planning process because they are the eyes and ears out here. They're the traditional ecological knowledge. They know where the Loki Way are, the clam terraces that have sustained our people. They know the best places to go for halibut. They know the safe ports to go to in a storm and all those sorts of things. And so that's all part of the epistemology that has to happen in transferring that knowledge. So they're really stalwarts and keepers of our of our customs and our and our traditions. The ironic thing is that when our reserves were allocated, they were very small parts of lands because the government told our people you live off the sea, not off the land. So that was uh, very wrong, but now we're into the marine plan and it has uh, great possibilities.
to me that they're almost endless. You know, we can create a different types of employment. And uh, that's what's really needed amongst my people. And we need to have employment so we can give our people some self-respect back and they can stand and walk tall. That's uh, one hard thing to see is when we have uh, young people don't feel they have a future and they take their own lives and that's, that's very hard to accept. I don't accept it. I've had my own family members, uh, my, my brother-in-law, my nephew and my cousin all took their own lives all within five months, and that's not acceptable. And that's because they thought they had no, no future. Uh, they were wrong, but it's too late. Hopefully we can, uh, we can keep going and then uh, give everybody that needs it some hope create the employment that's needed and that's something that I feel very, very passionate and strongly about. Because it hurts, it hurts deep down. It's important to re-establish that tie between the youth and their traditional territories and get them to understand that they come from these magical places that don't have cable, that don't have video games, but there's this way of life that sustained their ancestors for thousands of years. So part of our economic development plan includes working with the aquaculture industry, working on the existing management of salmon resources, ground fish resources, the processing of those seafood resources. We think there needs to be more value added to keep some of the jobs in the territory of where these fisheries are being taken from. That's important to our people. It's important to our communities to have our people working in our communities. We're looking at more ways to build sustainable economic development that lead to solid job creation. Um, we've been working too much on temporary job solutions and we need to really rejig the playing field to understand how we can make this a long-term success. The Namuncolis Council is comprised of six member First Nations whose traditional territories are located in the northern Vancouver Island and adjacent south central coast areas of British Columbia. Their office is located in Campbell River. My first task with the council was developing a regional economic development strategic plan. Naturally, a lot of the sector areas that we focused on tend to be related to the marine economy, uh, commercial fisheries, um, aquaculture, sustainable aquaculture interests, and um, uh, marine tourism. You guys were at Compton Island just uh, the other day with Harold. I was pretty excited to have this this challenge or this task and to be the one responsible to lead it and uh, I have to admit I am I have somewhat of a bias uh, my family is um, th five generations of commercial fishermen on the coast and I believe that you know prior to contact in how our coastal communities live the the, the line of my family would have had that responsibility of of managing the fish resources, of gathering and collecting and harvesting fish resources, as many of the people did in our community. But that's a strong connection that I've always felt to, to fisheries. How do we increase First Nation participation in the marine economy? And uh, I found I learned a lot. I didn't realize the extent to um, all the different sort of um, businesses and even uh, subsectors within that catch all of the marine economy from transportation, renewable energy explorations, um, aquaculture obviously. I think there's a strong skill set over just experience of living in these areas, of uh, knowing you know, navigation routes. Um, a lot of our people will make great water taxi boat captains, uh, tug captains, freight transport, tour guides and, and 
eco adventure, cultural tourism. So, what are those barriers that are in place that are not seeing our, the full participation in those sectors? And uh, that's been those has been starting to be identified, and we're looking at ways of how we can help um, change that. In front of uh, the, the bow of the boat is uh, a very well-pronounced Lohkiwe. It's uh, a clam garden. Lohkiwe, it means the way the rocks were rolled. Our old people rolled the rocks down to the edge of the low, low water mark. Wave action would put silt over the top of it to build up a terrace so that the people could gather their clams from these beds at a smaller tide than they would normally have without the terrace there. There's some 470 plus clam gardens that are identified in this, in this area. It sustained a lot of our people. There were times when the salmon runs were poor, so our people relied heavily on the clam gardens to, to keep them alive. Another thing I'm very proud of is these clam gardens, some of them have been carbon dated back to more than 10,000 years, 12,000 I was told. That makes uh, my people the first aquaculturists in the world. And that's really been a focus of the marine planning process is it's a great way to introduce, hey, in the old days we did this, in the future we want to continue to do this. What steps do we need to take now to ensure that we're going to be able to do that in the future? What knowledges do we have to pass down to various generations? What kind of capacity building do we need to do so that this is just something that goes on? It's not something that stops. We rekindle it, stops, we rekindle it. Make sure that we have that even flow of capacity that goes on for future generations. This one's a prawn because it's got the white spots. This one's a side shrimp because it's got white strips down this way. And this one I believe is called a tiger shrimp because the stripes are going up and down. And this one's called the red shrimp, pink, pink shrimp, red shrimp. These three here are shrimp because they don't eat meat. This is a prawn because he does eat meat. In 2013, 14, when I engaged our member nations on, what are your key community well-being and capacity needs? Uh, we developed a plan around that, and it was really exciting because it, it had this sort of holistic um, framework of you know, sort of five key areas that contribute to First Nations well-being. You know, culture, uh, the strength of the vibrancy of our culture and our communities, our connection to place is so important. Community was one of those categories, and that has factors of our relationships with one another as a community, or even just more physical, like the infrastructure needs that our communities have to be functioning and be able to provide for the citizens of the community. Health, as far as our, our physical health, the mental health, and our spiritual health. So obviously there's going to be some overlap between these category areas. Resource stewardship was a big one, separated on its own because of the importance of managing our resources sustainably in that they will be here for future generations. And economic prosperity has been another, the other area to help sort of tie it together in that uh, we need some financial independence to be able to support our our community's ability to grow and develop and our government's abilities to, um, to manage the resources and to provide services to our people. It's important for us to do a hard analysis check of the health of our ecosystems. We have fisheries watersheds that have just been destroyed. We have some that are near destruction and so it's a matter of prioritizing which ones are fixable in the near term, which ones are going to take some longer time to to recuperate and bring around and that's all part of our implementation plan. Of course, you know that costs money. That's why we've had to work so closely with the other nations up and down the coast to build this implementation fund so that we can make sure that we're 
fixing parts of the territory all the way up from our territory up to the Haidas, across to the Central Coast guys, to make sure that we're not just focusing everything in one area because it's politically convenient. So there's a discipline that has to be struck amongst ourselves, but we believe that that was the same discipline that our forefathers used. Um, these territories and the bounty that exists within them sustained our people for thousands of years at probably a hundred times the population levels that we have right now. So we know it can provide if it's managed and taken care for well. That's Village Island. This is the Mountain Lights Inlet. Turner Island's up here where we're going. I think that's where we're going anyway. The halibut, this is the halibut all around through here. This is where we fished halibut right there. We just dropped the long line for our halibut gear. And then down below that, at the rock, is where we put our prawn traps. You know, we've developed these tremendous plans over the last half dozen years, and they're only as good as the implementation's gonna be. So we have all these visions about how we're gonna restore some fish watersheds, how we're gonna change how logging practices are done and how it affects the marine environment. And so it's a matter of taking those relationships and implementing these plans so that we're actually having a positive gain when it comes to the ecological issues around our territories. And we understand that there has to be a balance between the economy, protection, and those sorts of things. And so that's why it's important for us to work with the other stakeholders in the region. You don't want to do a plan that's going to sit on a shelf, that's not going to be implemented. That's very important. And I think that if the process is very engaging and uh, there's opportunity for different points of views to be heard and people to come together, then that's how you create that energy, um, the commitment to um, see it through to the next levels. nations have brought a dream on how they want to see their territories managed into the future and all we've done is simply found people to support our dream. The MAP initiative has raised the profile or raised the need to work together in certain areas and uh, as far as some of the implementation activities coming out of that, that's what we see happening. Really so important that the nations have found a way to work together and in 20 years from now that there is a powerhouse of a commercial enterprise that is First Nations owned and operated enterprise. This corporate entity is doing a very good job at marketing the sustainable harvest of the commercial fisheries that take place in our territories and that's probably the biggest thing for me. Not to overstate the importance of that our nations and our members are also leading the work on the environmental monitoring and research that needs to take place to ensure that sustainability needs are truly being met. Some of the challenges we face when it comes to implementing our marine plans is still decisions are made on the almighty dollar and that's just a fundamental philosophy that we have to break away from but it's not something that happens overnight and it's actually incumbent upon us as First Nations leaders to play that role, to bring that balance to the environmentalists, to bring that balance to the industry and make sure that they understand that there's a long-term game plan here. It's not about the next quarter profits or the next fundraising campaign. This is about a long-term plan to bring sustainability back to our communities as it existed before contact. It's no secret that the Great Bear Rainforest is one of the last majestic places left on the earth and the Great Bear Sea is probably twice as majestic as that and we've gotten enough people who are living in it, dependent on it, who've agreed that it needs to continue to be a majestic place and so that really puts us in a position of opportunity.